This is episode 12 of the Florida Sound Archive podcast. I'm Jeff Kaiser. My guest for December 2020 is South Florida rock legend Charlie Pickett. In my interview with Charlie, he talks about growing up in South Florida, his musical influences, the underrated Florida rock punk music scene of the 1980s, road stories, and of course, his music. I am honored to have had the opportunity to chat with Charlie about his life and, of course, all the great music. This is also the final podcast episode of the unprecedented year that was 2020. This is also the first year of the Florida Sound Archive podcast. So I want to express my sincerest thanks and gratitude to every guest who has come on the podcast, every listener, and every follower on Instagram. I thank you all. I am beyond excited for what's in store for 2021. So many awesome guests lined up to tell their story. If you're on Instagram, consider giving the Florida Sound Archive a follow. There you will find posts from my personal collection, all music from Florida's past, from rock to hip hop, jazz to punk, and everything else in between. You can also check out past episodes of the Florida Sound Archive podcast wherever you get podcasts. Each month, the Florida Sound Archive brings you a new interview with the people who left their mark on one of the many Florida music scenes. You can also stream all episodes from our website, floridasoundarchive.com. Thank you for listening and enjoy the interview. Now, I know you were born in Ohio, but moved to Dania, Florida at a really young age. What are some of your memories of living at, in Dania at that time? It was a uh, paradise. We lived at the uh, a cul-de-sac um, that had a – it was abandoned tomato fields behind us from the World War II. And by that time, they'd grown over and grown over. But uh, it, was, it was what we called the swamp. But in fact, it was more like a pine needle uh, Florida forest okay. in part. And, and so it was a great place to be a, a, a kid with a BB gun and, you know, okay. and just, a, you know, a place to really play hunter and Indians and war and fish and all that sort of thing. I got you. And were your parents, were they big music fans at that time? Mom listened to uh, the radio of the day. First song I remember is uh, Who's That Little Dog in the Window or something like that. And she listened to Elvis, and I remember her remarking, oh, he's such a great singer, but... And then uh, I forget what the but was, but I think it had something to do with his showmanship. Okay. <laughs> nice. Now, when I think of Dania, I, as a child, I had been to... The High Lie before and Jackson, so those were things that I was familiar with when I was when I was younger and going to Dania. What were some things around you at that time that really stood out to you and hold strong in your memory? Well, those two, uh, absolutely, yes, Jacksons and uh, and uh, the High Lie uh, Jacksons because I had a paper route and uh, so I was a kid with money 
And it was the kind of money that, you know, you stop and got an ice cream, you stop and got an ice cream. And, you know, we rode on bikes. And so, you know, we burned off all those calories real quick. <laughs> and Pirate's World was a uh, ongoing thing in, uh, oh, I don't know, probably 66 it started. And, um, you know, all kinds of bands came there. Uh, Jefferson Airplane, um, uh, Johnny Wynn recorded an album there. Um, a whole lot. B.B. King, uh, Ike nice. and Tina. I saw Ike and Tina at least twice there. Uh, it wow. was great. And it was old school. You know, it was like... Right. Just, just a, just a barn and a, and and a, some bleachers on the side and a whole lot of uh, floor down below and so you could always inch up to to the very front, which you know uh, we did. So That's you great. know I saw all those bands like six rows deep or sometimes you know front row period, if you call wow. standing a row. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> were there certain bands at that time that were more influences on you or maybe became later on? The first influence I had, real influence, was Rolling Stones. I mean, I I, I, okay. I was a fan of Jan and Dean uh, before then, um, you know, especially the Dead Man's Curve, which appealed to a kid. You know, a, a sure. boy especially, you know, oh, God, racing cars and tragedy and all that sort of thing. And then, uh, you know, the the uh, the Rolling Stones and all that blues rock really just resonated with me. That really just sunk in and got into my DNA. Wow. And, and you know, some of those bands, obviously, very well known. What about on the local side of things at that time when you were growing up? Were you aware of any bands who were playing locally at that time? Did you have a chance to see any of those bands play as maybe you got it older into your teen years? What was that like? My cousin, Mark Markham, was a big local guy. He was, I don't know, probably as big as anybody. And, uh, you know, they played for hundreds of people most of the time when they were playing. He... Uh, wrote the song Marble Country and uh, they had a it was re released on RCA and and uh sold you know quite a few records but never hit the national charts but it sure hit the the uh, local charts um other than Mark you know I I I was a kid without a car and so you know by the time uh you know bands like uh I don't know the 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 bands Jeff Limlich talks about that sort of stick in my mind as as groups that were rumors, I, I just didn't get a chance to ever go out and see them. You know, you had to ask your mother to take you to uh, <laughs> to a show, and that's, right. that's you know for a boy that's you know uh, somewhat demeaning or humiliating. I guess more the better word. You know, my my first concert was was National Acts where my right. mom would know what was going on and where I was and that kind of thing. I understand. You, you mentioned Mark Markham and uh, your cousin, and one of my favorite songs I believe he wrote, uh, If This Is Love, Can I Get My Money Back? Can you talk about that song for a little bit? And sure. Can you that? Sure. Uh, Mark did that with some guys here. Uh, Cos Candler was in it uh, and um, some other fellows from around here. And they were very big, and uh, Mark recorded it with them. And I went to one of the sessions. It was done at Criteria. The song is written sort of from truth. Mark was aggravated with his wife at the time. And uh, so, you know, it had that bite to it. And that's about, about all I know about it. And it seemed like that song seemed to appear a lot on a lot of releases you had put out. Was that because you just were just a big fan of that song, or did you think maybe that could be potentially a, a radio hit or something along those lines? Exactly the latter. Uh, I like the song a lot, and uh, so we recorded it first on the live album, but of course live albums rarely get a radio airplay, and then uh, we recorded it at least... Well, I'm sorry. We recorded it on a single, and then we recorded it again when we recorded with Peter Buck. And I uh, just, you know, I kept thinking, this song's too good to not get radio airplay. And uh, it just, yes, it got 
plenty of college radio airplay, but you know, it just didn't break into the commercial uh, ranks. Somebody told me that it John, Joan Jett had recorded it. Um, oh wow! And and that it just didn't make her album, uh, the final uh, version. Yeah. I see. So always try to get Mark some money for that record, but uh, right, it just hasn't really worked out yet. Yeah, that's a great song, though. So uh, you mentioned Peter Buck from R.E.M. So how did you get mm-hmm. linked up with him, and uh, what are some of your earlier memories of uh, maybe seeing R.E.M. back in that period? I guess the first time I saw him was 81. Uh, they came to the Agora. My friend uh, Leslie Wimmer was a big fan, and so she said, oh, you got to see these guys. So I went down, um, and Leslie was you know, a a big fan of mine and and of theirs. And so she said, oh, come backstage and meet him. And I'm not a fan of going to people's backstage. It just seems like intrusive to me a little bit. But but I did. And so uh, we went back, shook hands, and it turned out that they knew a bit about our stuff because by then we'd already released uh, If This Is Love and I think White Light, White Heat. And uh, so we just... Uh, Peter and I then really didn't hit it off at that time, but uh, uh, we hit it off later when I, you know, I, I saw them again over the years. By '86, I guess uh, we were. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say friends. I would say uh, friendly acquaintances. Um, okay. He he has my phone number. I have his, and we talk sometimes twice in a month and sometimes not once in two years. So there you go. But, uh, you know, sure. um, yeah, he, he produced uh, the 1987 album In the Wilderness, and right. uh, he got the best uh, uh, resulting mix and sound I've ever on any of our records. Um, he did a great job. He's a very responsible person and by that you know for a musician musicians are not necessarily responsible (laughs) he is he is and but at the same time he's not a sober size or anything he showed up every day uh before we were there and he stayed every day uh, until all of us had left basically but you know basically he sort of put in uh during those recording sessions he put in a 9 30 to 5 sort of day and for musicians that's a long day and uh and he was active he was he was mixing he was placing mics he was asking us to do uh takes again uh he was critiquing different takes and uh basically what he was doing was trying to get just live music meshing sound to to get gotcha. it so that it was it was a live sounding even though it was it was studio it was still that it had a, a life of its own. You mentioned also Leslie Wimmer too, who, as far as I, I I know, she founded Open Records. Is that right? Yes. Co-founded. What are some of your mem- Ted, Ted Godfrey. What were some of your memories of that label? It's the best. Uh, I can tell you that uh, when. My friend Kenny Lindell and I, who later played in the Eat, uh, went north to, uh, I don't know, I think Deerfield, uh, went to the first open books and records store. Uh, uh, we just, both of us just walked out of the store afterwards going, that girl, did you see that girl? Oh, my God. You know, she's just, you know, she she hit that vibe of, of uh, you know, guys who read books, who, you know, read you know, just just plain guys who read books, and she had that understanding of uh, of books and literature, and and uh, you know, uh, we were in our mid twenties by that point, but and we should have known more literary <laughs> girls, but we didn't, <laughs> and we were just smitten by her. So long story short, they had their record store, and uh, I walked in one af- one night or one afternoon, and with the idea in my mind that. You know, gee, I I, I want to ask these guys if if they would be willing to create a label and and put out some of some my you know a, a record or or two, and 
I walked in, and before I could say that to them, they said just exactly that to me. So it was okay. it was a great a great relationship, and uh, we're friends to this day. You know, just absolutely smitten. As as a as a postscript to the song, but I didn't, and all of all gone is about Leslie. Got it. And I know, mm-hmm. and it's so. I know I'm grateful for this compilation because I feel like it gives a snapshot in time of perhaps the scene going on throughout Florida at this time, the land that time forgot. What are your memories of that compilation? That was Ted and and Leslie's project, of course. We were involved, but they were so thrilled to do it because we believed, uh, me and them, believed that uh, South Florida had true value for the day, you know, for for the time, and that we were as good as any other scene or comparable to any other scene. Uh, if you listen to the writing, it's just it's just great writing. Uh, if nothing else, I think the writing on that record pretty much uh, is, is, is better than the writing uh, that was emanating from a lot of scenes. Uh, now, that doesn't mean every band... You know, for instance, Husker Du and the replacements, and and uh, I guess the replacements weren't going on by that point. But uh, but you know, certainly a lot of many Minneapolis bands and Athens bands were writing better. But you know, right. we we were our scene was writing very very well, and and was a whole lot better than most people's scenes. Jeff, I tell you that because by eighty two or three we were touring and so we got to see other people's scenes and uh so so we had a good eye to compare and just on that topic charlie in your opinion do you think that that time period that even looking back and where we are now do you think that scene that time period florida was was and still is underrated music scene when it comes to rock, punk, that sort of thing? Jeff, I can't express how much I think it is underrated and how much I sincerely believe it was. You take the Bobs, uh, you take the Cichlids, you take the Reactions, you take the Eat, and you take a whole lot of other bands and, right. uh, and stack them up against anything else and you're going to find in my opinion we were more original either that or better in terms of uh the sound better in terms of the attitude uh better in terms of the live show there's no band in the world to this day that really compares to the eat uh the reactions were uh, predated Green Day by at least three years and were in many ways better. Uh, Green Day, of course, evolved and became uh, a band that was able to 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 become more than they were when they started. But, oh, my gosh, the right. reactions were they, – they were, they were lightning in a bottle. Uh, right. The cichlids, cichlids were were stone cold great. Uh, um, their 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 album uh, didn't quite capture what it should have, but um, but uh, again, it, uh, they were they were marvelous. Um, so yes, the answer is in a short <laughs> in a nutshell. Yeah, the, the 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 scene of that day, eighty to eighty five, wow, was just yeah. Just a, an, uh, uh, an explosive uh, thing that, but it exploded in a vacuum. It was like exploding right. in a black hole, you know, all this action, and yet it, there was no reception uh, in the greater world market or even the national market. Exactly. You mentioned the cichlids, and they were also out of Dania. What are some of your memories of seeing and working with them? Oh, uh, lots and lots of them. They, uh, I was best friends with Bobby Mascaro, their manager, and the the guy who sort of just put it together. Uh, Debbie and I would go out for years, uh, uh, and with Bobby, and uh, go to 
Pancake House every Sunday and just talk about everything. Uh, <laughs> you know, I helped. Uh, our first recordings were done with Debbie. Uh, and when I say our, I mean Cichlids, me, uh, and and uh, some of the other Barry Seaver, who later joined the Cichlids. You know, we were, we learned to record and. Uh, multi-track recording is hard. Uh, right. It blow, it it puts you off. Um, as far as fun things, if you've ever if you've ever seen a woman sweat her whole dress from uh, straps to hem, you've seen a, just a regular Debbie Cichlid Cichlid show. Uh, that would be that would be the, what happened. Okay. She would sweat the whole dress because she wow. poured it on. Whenever they played a club, the air conditioner might start at 68 when they got on stage, and by the time, uh, if you looked at the thermostat, it would be 81 when they left the stage. That's that's how they heated up a room. Wow, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I know just from hearing a lot of these stories that obviously there was a connection to you know more of the rock punk scene of that era and what about on the other end of the spectrum because i know at the time uh especially south florida with henry stone were you aware of what he was doing as well with like tk records and that sort of thing sure we all were and oddly enough uh henry stone uh created or had a, a side label and, that, and he put out or that that record company put out uh, the cichlid record um, right but yeah, sure, we were aware of it. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, but there was Did no have crossover. Ch- I gotcha. Did you have a chance to see any of those bands, those soul bands, those funk bands that were kind of around at that time? Uh, not me. No, I was kind of snooty about <laughs> about that sort of thing. <laughs> I gotcha. I gotcha. And that's fair. So when you started up Charlie Pickett and the Eggs, uh, was that like the first actual cohesive band that you put together? Yes and no, Jeff. Uh, I didn't put the band together. It was put together uh, by Barry Seaver. So he put the band together, and, and it was his discipline and organizational skills that that made the band uh, uh, cohesive. And so, yes, it was my first band, but but I didn't put it together. I gotcha. I gotcha. And one of my favorite records that the band put out was Live at the Button. Can you talk a little bit about the recording and making that record? Uh, I've always been a fan of Get Your Yayas Out, and I wanted to make a modern Get Your Yayas Out uh, record. And so uh, the guys from Sync Studio, where we were uh, practicing, also had a studio, of course. And uh, so I just asked them, you know, could you, would you want to, would you record this? And they were geniuses. They, all that we had at that point in time was a TAC Task M8 track. And so uh, they reduced all the drums to five tracks. Or, I'm sorry, they reduced the five drum tracks to two tracks. And uh, then they they mic'd the crowd uh, with one mic, and then they close mic the instruments and the and the sound. the 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 button, of course, that was the only time we ever played there was to record that. And you know, the band was it was it was a great band at that point in time. It, it was it was Johnny Sticks was absolutely a, a locomotive. You couldn't fail to play with that kind of drumming going on behind you. And uh, David Froschneider was a genius, and Johnny Salton was just uh, a, a intuitive, uh, brilliant painter of oral sounds with his guitar. And uh, that that was a you know that was a point in time in which the scene was cohesive, and uh, everybody showed up. Uh, to the shows, and uh, there weren't so many clubs. So basically, the whole, a whole scene would 250 people would show up one night for the reactions, and the next night the Eat were playing, and the whole scene would show up for that. And so that's it was a great time of life. 
And by the way, all that screaming in uh, Live at the Button on uh, uh, feeling, but that was, uh, uh, oh, I don't know. That was something that the girls had done, the girls in the audience had done, uh, Cookie Mold and, and, and Sam, uh, and they, it, was, it was mock swooning. So it okay. wasn't, <laughs> wasn't screaming for me. It was mock screaming. They liked to do it. I'm glad you cleared that up because I was wondering yeah. about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those, also, those girls were brilliant, by the way. They they were so brilliant. Yeah. I, I went out, oh, I don't know, maybe three or four times with them after uh, shows and uh, to like Toddle House or to, or to uh, uh, oh, I don't know, the diner there in, in Lauderdale. And, uh, and th- they were so brilliant in conversation that, you know, it was it was absolutely another. It was like an after show show to listen to them talk. Anyway, gosh, okay, <laughs> sounds like something you'd you'd see after you'd experience after hours. Absolutely, yes. they were really. Okay. You mentioned obviously the the button was one venue, and you mentioned some others. What are some of your memories of other venues at that at, in that era, and uh, some of the ones that you frequented most often? Um, everybody started at the premier club, at least for the Hollywood Broward crowd. Um, it was fantastic. There was, uh, some early, uh, punk girls and they called themselves, uh, Nazi lesbian dykes, I think. And, okay. uh, you know, it was sort of taken off of the whole Susie Sue British, uh, yeah. uh, look. And, uh, they, they were fantastic. I mean, seriously, uh, there would be sex on the dance floor, and uh, mostly show sex in a way. I mean, girls groping each other for to be to be what is it called? Exhibitionist sort of. I guess, and of course, right. the girls 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 were slightly drunk, and and uh, also I'm sure there was some coke or something. And uh, but uh, that that was one scene, and then of course New Wave Lounge up in Lauderdale was pretty much the same thing. It was Sodom and Gomorrah in the bathrooms. Uh, there was as many boys in the girls' bathrooms as uh, as there was girls, and uh, vice versa. As many girls in the boys' bathrooms as there were boys, uh, <laughs> and uh, there was there was dancing, and and it was just again it was it would be so hot in there by the end of the night. Uh, that was one of my favorites. Were you getting up at all to other venues outside of South Florida, let's say maybe Orlando or maybe even out west, Sarasota, up north, Jacksonville, Tallahassee? Were you getting up to any, any venues in those areas at that time too? Well, yes. We would play because we realized that uh, we were a little bit smart and a little bit stupid uh, business-wise. We were we realized that one way to reach the world and never leave home was to release records. And so we did that. And, and, yeah. uh, and then we also said, well, gee, you know, uh, one way to get out is, is to get going. And so we, we were very nervous about leaving town and to the Cuban club and, you know, we had a great reception there from the from the folks in Tampa. Um, uh, we went to Tallahassee and had a great reception there from the people there. And and so yes, we did. We uh, we went. We did make it out. Things rolled for us. Were there any bands along the way locally that you were kind of discovering for the first time that you were you were a fan of? Um, we liked the Slut Boys out of Tampa, uh, Tallahassee. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. We liked, uh, oof, again, I'm, it's a long time ago. Um, we loved a band out of Tampa. They were really smart. I, I, I can't remember their name. I, I remember Carl, and I remember uh, 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 the drummer, but I can't remember the name. I'm sorry, Jeff. That's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think myself because this was, this was in the early 80s or mid-80s. Yes, yes, early 80s. Yeah. 
So speaking about the bands that you were in and all the things you had done, uh, you'd also worked very closely and had members of this band play in your band as well, uh, the Psycho Daisies. What are some of your memories of them? Oh, uh, the Psycho Daisies. <laughs> the Psycho Daisies are my band, are 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 the are the Charlie <laughs> right. Pickett band, uh, right. without Charlie Pickett. So, uh, you know, yeah, I know all of them, and uh, my God, the, the, I, two of them are dead, of course. David is right. the only one left. Uh, and and when I say that, I, I say Psycho Daisies version one. Psycho Daisies uh, continued for for many years with different people in it, Jill Kahn and, and uh, Lisa uh, from the Screaming Sneakers um, but uh, uh, and Billy Ritchie and a lot of people. Um, but they were my friends. Um, they, they were a great band. In fact, in my opinion, they were a better band than, than the Charlie Pickett outfit. So I, I, I think in many ways I limited our, our uh, artistic output by um, having too narrow a set of tastes. Uh, the daisies, it wasn't like the daisies really were vastly different. They weren't like all of a sudden uh, Captain Beefheart or anything. But the daisies right. had, had, a, had a wider vision um, regarding chord structure and regarding lyrics. And, uh, right. and da- David sings much better than I do, and so did, uh, so did Mike Pettit. Uh, and of course, Lisa Nash does uh, sings better, way better than I do. But um, anyway, they're, they're great guys. Uh, <laughs> you know, they. Uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll give you an anecdote. Uh, it's a little bit, a little bit fun. Uh, they took off to go up north, and and they were touring, and and they came back, and and uh, you know, in in our band, we. We never fought. We just didn't fight. And uh, for some reason, without me there, they got in a fight in the van one time, and you know, a, a total knockdown, dragout fight in the van. So, you know, and wow. they, of course, they made up. They made up later, of course. But uh, it's just funny, funny how the chemistry works. Sure. I was going to ask you too. You having a lot of time too on the road, going to different cities and states and what have you. Uh, are there any road stories that just you, you'll never forget? They just stand out to you so much. Something that you, that you can share with the listeners? Uh, God, dozens and dozens. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you one that's uh, it, it's hit my mind at the moment when you ask. We went into Minneapolis and we uh, were thrilled to find out that our sound man for the night was Billy Batson, who was the singer for the, an incredible band called the hipsters. And, uh, we played and, uh, Jeff, I got to tell you that when you're, when you're on the road, there is no greater adrenaline than, than, than playing in that, a town for the first time. So right. in other words, you go out there and you say, this is what I want to do. I want to be here tonight, and I want to, I want to light this place up so that when somebody talks about what did you do last night, they'll say, oh, my God, we went to see Charlie Pickett and, and, and the Eggs, and, and I, I, that's what I wanted, and that's what we all wanted. We, we wanted to play our brand of, of music. So anyway, we, we go into Minneapolis and we, we, I would, I wouldn't say we lit it up, but we only slightly modest. I'll say that we, we did a, a good show. And, uh, so, so when we leave, uh, one of the things about being in a band is it's an aphrodisiac for, for a lot of people. So we all stayed at this one girl's house that, you know, invited us back and uh, so our road manager on that particular trip was a guy named Richard Shelter. And uh, we think that the girl initially wanted to uh, be romantic with Michael, who was really good looking. And uh, so we all pretended to fall asleep in the living room on the couches and the chairs and stuff like that. Because that was, that was uh, an era in which, you know, we really didn't, 
want to spend money on hotel rooms. Long story short, right. Richard Richard jumps up and goes back and knocks on her door. And Richard was such a great manager and talker that he actually talked his way into this girl's bedroom. And we were listening <laughs> to him. We were all, all out there just snickering and snickering about how he's actually negotiating, you know, meeting her every move with a counter move. And it was it was funny to us. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of really wonderful memories that you have of that time and uh, the trips on the road. You mentioned, though, Minneapolis and when you were up that way, and I can't help but want to now talk about Route 33. (laughs) So, you know, that is one of my personal favorite records, uh, and I love the old stuff, too. I really did stuff prior Mm -hmm. to that. But that record, to me, was like a shift and in the sound and I don't know if it was just because of where you were and who you were recording with but it was like a shift and I really loved the more uh, almost like Americana kind of kind of vibe that I got from that record what are some of your memories of making that one uh, that's a great question you're, you're right about the shift um, at that point the word Americana somewhere between our, our, our cowboy junkie record and and that record the word Americana started getting kicked around, and I thought, I, I was wrong, but I thought that the word meant Native American music, meaning mm. uh, native, native, to, uh, native American rock and roll. So right. sort, of a, uh, sort of a, this is what the guys on the street or the girls on the street do. This is how they create it. So for me, it meant everything from R.E.M. to... Uh, to uh, 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 Husker Du. And so we started thinking and, and, thinking and, and also uh, writing, not necessarily to that, but trying to write deep into it. In other words, what I'm trying to say is many bands write broadly. They try to expand music. All we were trying to do was drive blues rock as hard down into the hole as we could. In other words, deep drill it, go down right. to the to the basic. So, for instance, with uh, you know we covered Sunhouse's Death Letter um, in the way that we wanted to do it, and we didn't want to expand the vocabulary of music. We wanted to deepen the vowels. So that was that was our our, our effort on that song on that record. And of course, David wrote some some wonderful things and uh and and it, it was i think our best written record ever you know i was kind of surprised and i don't know how this all worked back then but i was like you know there are there were a lot of movies back then that were about traveling and and i just felt like there was a many songs on that album that could have been used for a soundtrack. Were you ever approached about having a song in a movie or film? No. The answer is, the short answer is no. And, and I, I, I agree with you. As a matter of fact, the song REM, uh, I'm sorry, remember every moment was actually written uh, with the idea of, of getting it uh, uh, into a commercial venture uh, the song was written as a, as an amusement almost to uh, to uh, because if you if you listen hard uh, all the all guys from REM are named in the song uh, and the the name of it is remember every moment so uh, it was an homage more or less and uh, so I I thought oh my God this is perfect for Kodak film. Just perfect. Remember every moment. It should be their right. theme, you know. And <laughs> we we did we did have a publisher at that time uh, who was in the business, and uh, so I don't think it was neglect. I don't I don't think anything like that. It was just um, it had just never worked out for us. I and I don't, you know, I, to this day I don't understand why. But you know, I, I don't I don't spend time trying to trying to think about those kinds of things or feel bad about them. Sure. Because, you know, sure. I, I got to tell you, Jeff, we, you know, for guys, for guys from South Florida, we did 99% of everything we wanted to do. We did, we did everything but get the money. And you know what? <laughs> That's so great. 
you're still you still come out, right? You still come out and and play gigs every every now and again. Is that right? I I, I did until until last year. Oh, well, until this year, really. Uh, right. And you know, right now I I have no desire to play some sort of a living room show. Uh, it's just not. Uh, I can't imagine uh, that being any fun. Yeah, it seems like that's what a lot of a lot of people are now having to uh, resort to is something along mm-hmm. along those lines. So uh, you know, you having played so many years of music and having a chance to see so many great bands and and uh, play with some really awesome people along the way. Any regrets that you had, kind of looking back, or? Well, you know, I I am a guy who uh, tries to write songs, or I li- let me put it this way: my better songs that I like are regret songs, or at least written from a place of regret. Uh, but I, I really just don't have any regrets of the band. I mean, yes, I, I, in my mind, I said, well, gee, why do we, why it would have been nice to get the, the money. Uh, it would have been nice to, um, to do this uh, differently a little bit. We should have gone to Europe. I, I regret that we never did. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I think, you know, commercially it might have ended up differently if we had, but we, we right. were naive. We, we were just kids from, from Miami and there were no adults in the room for us. Nobody was in the music business saying, gee, these guys are good and let me help them, you know, or let me manage them or anything. So we didn't know that we should have borrowed enough money from our parents or, or, or from other people and just got on a plane and got to Europe and got to England and, 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 uh, you know, pounded it out. Uh, you know, the, the, Editor in chief of Melody Maker wrote a, you know, I don't know, seven paragraph essay about how great Live at the Button was. It was, it was uh, in Melody Maker. It was, you know, we just thought these things would naturally happen, and we didn't know that we needed to do more to make it happen. Right. So no, I don't have it. I don't have any regrets because because we did ninety nine percent of everything we ever intended and set out to do. Right. Uh, let me ask you this question on that note. A lot of people I've talked to over the years, when I mention the name Charlie Pickett, they say he's a Florida legend. How do you think huh. about and how do you feel about that? You know, it doesn't feel like that in my own mind. I just feel like <laughs> a lucky guy. I got you. I got you. And I also know, too, and I'll kind of wrap up with this, too, uh, and I have seen you post a few on Facebook, a few records out of your collection. Uh, what does Charlie Pickett's record collection look like? Uh, right now, it's, I, I gave it all away um, oh. yeah, to, to, to Mike Velo because I, I just because I wanted to, you know, nothing worse than uh, uh, having a whole bunch of records around that, Frankly, Jeff, you know I'm 67 now, and so you know right, I don't right, I don't right. want I don't want to leave a whole bunch of records to my son, and then he sells them for a nickel a piece to a, a record <laughs> uh, uh, a wholesaler. Uh, I, I want to give them away to my friends and have them enjoy them. So, that, so that's what I did. Uh, yeah. What do I listen to? I listen to uh, Bootleg Stones. I listen to uh, Sunhouse. I listen to Fred McDowell. I'm always buying new CDs, and I like CDs because I'm an old guy. And they they have what I call the uh, I-95 test, which is uh, I put it in my car. I listen to it one time through. I if I don't if I'm not impressed, I put it in the back seat, and uh, and then I pull it out another few days later, and I listen to it again. And if it doesn't pass. Uh, if I don't like it after two two attempts, I throw it out uh, the window on I-95 while I'm driving. And if it <laughs> happens to happens to go out and sail back in the back window, uh, then okay, it was meant to be. But other than that, nobody's passed the I-95 test yet. <laughs> okay. So if there's any CDs that are on the side of the road in 95, they could be Charlie Pickett. Is what you're they, saying? They very well might be. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Anything else you want to add in closing? 
Jeff, you ask about stories. I'll, I'll give you one of my favorites. I'll tell you one of my favorites. And I, it, it slipped my mind when you asked about it. We went out to Los Angeles and we played the music machine. And the next, and they, and the, the, the management and the people liked us. And so they said, "Oh gosh, you know, how many days are you in town?" And we said, "You know, three or four or five. And and uh, they said, well, here, you know, just, just come back anytime you want and see any show. So we knew we were playing with uh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers in San Francisco. So we went to see them at the Music Machine the next night. And, oh, my God, what a great show. And I thought, oh, they're going to blow us away in San Francisco. But, you know, look, that, that's happened before. And uh, all you do is say, we play one thing. They play another thing. I'm glad everybody loved what all of us did. You know, that's all you didn't rationally hope for, you know, if you got your head on straight. So we go up to uh, San Francisco, and we played one show. I uh, forget where. Mabway Gardens, I think. And then the next time we played the I-Beam, and uh, I guess it was maybe it was packed. That's a small-ish club. I think it holds 350, 400. When we got there, the Red Hot Chili Peppers management said, uh, well, uh, you know, you guys, I think one of our guys went in their dressing room and they said, oh, well, you know, we, we like to keep our dressing room private and all that, and which is fine. I think it's very legitimate to do that. But, you know, nevertheless, I at that time thought, well, that's awfully snooty. And so I, we went out and we played our show. Now, the I-beam has a thin stage, and so you got to set your drummer up at the right-hand corner of the stage, and you, then the three of you play, you know, left to right, one way or the other. Well, the, the Chili Peppers are a funk band, and we are a band at that point that had been on the road by, I don't know, 60 days or something. We were playing, of those 60 days, we had played 55 probably at that point. And so, you know, all I needed to know was basically have some sort of basic, you know, inkling of where sticks was uh, on the drum kit, and and so we just we just played, and at the end of the show, I looked to my left and I saw Cyril Jordan, and I I, I thought, well, we're, before before we played, I thought, well, we're not going to play any Flame and Groovy songs because you know this is San Francisco. And so uh, when I saw Cyril uh, on, at the bar, I went, oh, my God, that's Cyril. And so it was one of those nights where you play and, and the crowd wants an encore. And so we went out and we played uh, Shake Some Action. And I looked over and saw Cyril grinning from ear to ear. And uh, so I thought, oh, how, how fine is that? You know, he's one of my heroes and, you know, he likes what we're doing on it. And. Uh, and the postscript is that the Chili Peppers, being a funk band and their drummer far away, did not play very well at all. And <laughs> two thirds, two thirds of the audience was gone when they uh, when they stopped. And and they had the uh, oh I don't know audacity to do the sock trick right. to a one third to a one third full club. And I thought, wow, that's that's something, you know. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe there's a little mean spiritedness to that story, but but uh, I enjoy it anyway. Did you know about the whole sock thing that they did at that time? Or was that the first time you saw that? Oh no, I, I had seen it at the Music Machine the week before. Okay, and of course it, it goes over it goes over great when the club is packed, right. rocking, and and all yeah. that stuff. But it was it was uh, I mean to me it was embarrassing to play it to a one third. Uh, one third full club and uh, anyway. Uh, I appreciate you sharing that, that last story and it's just been wonderful talking with you and having a chance to hear more about just your career and some of the stories throughout, throughout this. And I really appreciate it. And uh, you are definitely a Florida legend in my eyes and I'm glad I had a chance to interview you and I'm just grateful for that. So, and thank you for all you've done for for music and what you've contributed. And I, you know, I know plenty of people out there, including myself, really appreciate it. So, thank you, Charlie. Jeff, uh, I, I, you're welcome. Uh, but I'm the recipient uh, of of more joy than I ever uh, thought I would ever get. 
So uh, I, I've, I've loved all this. One, two, three, four. Sit down. She was woman and I was born. Things like a loving heart 